All right, in this video, we're gonna talk about a super sensitive topic. We're going to address the real cause of weight gain, and it's not the one you've been told. Now, we've heard that processed foods, including sugar, are the real problem behind our ever-expanding waistlines, and we've heard it so much and for so long that we start to believe it's true, but is it? I'm James Grage, and we're about to dig into this highly debated subject. Now, fair warning, this video is probably going to offend a few people, but the reality is we can't talk solutions until we can address the real problem. All right, so let's start by talking about why it's so popular to believe that processed foods are why we're storing more body fat than ever before in history. Now, here comes the whiteboard again. There's always got to be a whiteboard. So we've all seen the chart where obesity rates in this country were almost non-existent in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and then all of a sudden, starting in the 50s, we start seeing this uptick. Now, this rise in obesity rates correlates perfectly to a period of time in the 1950s when we saw a revolution in food processing and distribution, as well as the advent of fast food like McDonald's marking the very beginning of this problem. Now, if you look at the chart, it makes a lot of sense. It lines up perfectly. So there's this popular narrative that processed foods, meaning refined carbohydrates and sugars, are causing rises in blood sugar levels. This is causing a subsequent increase in insulin levels. And that right there is why processed foods are the driver of weight gain in this country. Look, here's the reality. We are eating way too much of these processed foods, and that does affect blood sugar levels, and that does affect insulin levels, but that in itself is not the main reason we're gaining weight in this country. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to convince you that processed foods aren't a problem, but when it comes to gaining weight or adding body fat, you have to separate in your mind the difference between the nutritional value of food versus the caloric value of food. In other words, healthy foods help us meet our nutritional needs, making sure that we are getting the right amount of macro and micronutrients. So those are your essential amino acids, your essential fatty acids, your essential vitamins and minerals, all the things that we need to be healthy. But it's the caloric value of food, meaning the amount of energy stored in that food that we measure in terms of calories that's going to influence whether we gain weight or lose weight. There's clearly a crossover between eating healthier and eating to lose weight, but they are still two separate things. So let's use the example of a study that's now famous that got the nickname, the Twinkie Diet. So this was an informal experiment by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Mark Hobb, who is a professor over at Kansas State University. So Dr. Hobb was eating in a calorie deficit, a slight deficit for him. He was eating about 1,800 calories a day. But here's the thing. The calories that he was getting were coming from things like Twinkies, donuts, candy bars, and other types of sugary snacks. Now, over the 10 weeks they did this experiment, he lost 27 pounds despite the types of foods that he was eating. And on top of it, he also saw a decrease in his LDL, or his bad cholesterol, as some people refer to it, an increase in his HDL, his good cholesterol, and also saw his triglycerides come down, all of which are overall markers for cardiovascular health. So what does this tell us? Well, number one, and this is a big one, whether we gain weight or lose weight comes down to something called energy balance. So that starts off with the amount of energy coming in from the foods we eat. So this goes back to the caloric value of that food, not the nutritional value. So the amount of calories in that food versus the other side, the amount of energy that we expend in a day. And we expend energy in several different ways. One is gonna be our resting metabolic rate, the other is going to be daily activity. Exercise is going to fall into that, as well as calories that we burn just digesting our food. Now, if those two things are perfectly balanced, then you don't lose weight and you don't gain weight. 
but if the amount of calories that we consume is greater than the amount that we expend, then we are going to gain weight, period. Doesn't matter how healthy those foods are. Now, the opposite, if we are consuming less than we are expending in a day, meaning a calorie deficit, then we are going to lose weight independent of how healthy those foods are or aren't, as in the case of Dr. Mark Hobb. The second big takeaway from this is the fact that considering Dr. Hobb was eating really low quality, unhealthy foods, his health markers improved. And so what that tells us is that one of the most powerful things that we can do for our overall health is manage our weight. Now, with that being said, to be totally fair and objective, this experiment definitely punctuates the importance of calorie management for weight management. But the quality of foods we eat, meaning eating healthier foods, still matters for our overall health and well being. Now, ideally, you would have a combination of both. And even in this experiment, Dr. Hobb did take in a protein supplement every day to make sure that he was getting adequate essential amino acids as well as taking a multivitamin to make sure he was getting both his essential vitamins and minerals. Now, he didn't monitor his blood sugar levels during this experiment, at least not to my knowledge. And I would assume that eating all those sugary foods, he absolutely saw spikes in his blood sugar level, therefore insulin levels were higher. But I would also add to that and say that because he was in a calorie deficit, eating less of those things, I would say it's unlikely that he saw blood sugar levels elevated over a long period of time. Which brings me to my next point. The quality of a carbohydrate as it relates to how that impacts blood sugar levels is measured by something called glycemic index. Now, that doesn't take into consideration how much of it we're eating, which can impact blood sugar levels just as much, sometimes if not more, than the quality of it. And that is where glycemic load comes into play, which factors in the glycemic index or the quality of the food in combination of how much you're eating. So again, this really punctuates the fact it's not just about what we eat, it's how much of it we're eating. So let's go back to our chart for a minute here. Was it simply because of the low quality foods that Americans were starting to consume around the 1950s that led to this upturn in obesity rates? Or are there other factors that line up with this timeline? So what else happened in the 1950s? Well, for starters, this was right after World War II where we saw what a lot of people call the golden age of capitalism. So this was an economic boom in this country where people now saw an increase in wages, increase in consumer spending. And you compare that in contrast to the 1930s and even the early 40s where we were recovering from the Great Depression, where people went from starving and having to ration to all of a sudden now this newfound prosperity. So then we move on to the 1960s and we see the government come in with subsidies, subsidies for farmers to increase production. We also saw programs like food stamps come in. So now all of a sudden, even lower income families can afford to eat. So with growing wages, more dependable employment, we saw people now being able to afford to go out to dinner or to buy more convenience foods. So where having an abundance of food was once considered a luxury, now all of a sudden, it's available to everybody. Here's another interesting thing that happened in the 1950s. So right around the end of the 40s, 1948, there were approximately 8,000 homes in this country that had a television. By the time we hit 1960, that jumped to 45 million homes. So how does that affect our eating habits? Well, all of a sudden that gave all these food companies the ability to market to us all these new convenience foods where all of a sudden we have food at our fingertips. And it also influenced the eating habits of that next generation, everyone who was a kid at that time. Those people are what we call 
baby boomers. Now, watching TV also became a new form of leisure in this country. And remember, weight gain isn't just about the amount of calories coming in, it's about the amount of calories that we're expending in a day. So now all of a sudden we have a new form of leisure where we get to sit down. Now, there was a company that actually capitalized on this, a brand called Swanson, that in the 50s invented the TV dinner. And by 1955, they sold 25 million TV dinners. Now, here's something else that I find super fascinating. You don't hear a lot of people talk about this, something that correlates perfectly with this chart here, and that is dinner plate sizes. So in the 1960s, your average dinner plate was about eight and a half to nine inches. We jump to the 1980s, and that jumps up to about 10 inches. The 2000s roll along, we're now up to 11 inches. Today, 2024, we got restaurant chains like the Cheesecake Factory that have plate sizes that are 12 inches plus. It's almost double the surface area here. Also means you can hold double the amount of calories on this plate as you could here in the 60s. So if anything, this punctuates the fact that it's not just about the quality of the foods we're eating, it's the quantity. And the problem with these processed foods is simply the fact that they taste so good and they're so convenient and it's so easy to overeat. And that right there is the real driver of weight gain in this country over consumption. Now, with that being said, I'm a huge advocate of eating better, higher quality foods. And clearly, the more we mess with nature's perfect balance, the more problems that we create. We like to strip out all the fiber out of the fruits and vegetables and grains that we eat. This leads to satiety or hunger issues, blood sugar spikes, and a whole slew of other health-related problems. But we simply can't blame the low-quality foods for our weight issues in this country. That's making ourselves the victims, and the reality is we have more control than that. Now, not everyone has access to the same high-quality foods, but we can absolutely control how much of this food we're shoving in our mouth. All right, so there you go. Hopefully that appeals to your sense of logic. If you would like to learn more about my nutritional philosophies, definitely check out the Fail Proof Master Course program that I put together on nutrition. You can find the link in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a like. I'd appreciate it. And if you want to see more content just like this, of course, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. I'm James Grage, and I'll see you next video.